WCW Bash at the Beach 97 took place on July 13th from Daytona Beach, Florida. Just under 8,000 fans packed the Ocean Center and around 325,000 fans bought the show on pay-per-view. Our show is headlined tonight with the in-ring debut of Dennis Rodman when he teams up with Hollywood Hogan. Rodzilla and the Hulkster do battle with the Giant and Lex Luger in our main event. DDP also has a mystery partner in attendance for a tag team match against Scott Hall and Randy Savage. Let's get started with the Bash at the Beach 1997 opening match. WCW's been on a roll lately with their opening matches and I wouldn't expect anything less from Bash at the Beach. Actually, scrap that, way to ruin a great run of matches, Frosty Balls. We have got Glacier and Ernest Miller, who we affectionately named Ice Ice Maybe on Reliving the War, and they are going up against Mortis and Wrath. Ernest Miller has shown a great deal of promise on WCW television, but his ring time has been kept seriously brief. Let's see if he stays inside the ropes a bit longer tonight. All four men fight to start the match off, but it settles down to Glacier and Mortis. Mortis smacks Glacier across the face, let's just watch that again a few times. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Glacier then pulls off a double leg takedown, Mortis then gets crotched on the top rope where he proceeds to take more damage. Wrath was just coming in to make sure Mortis was okay, but that dirty cheater Ernest Miller has to come in with a springboard kick. Miller then gets tagged in and we see some good teamwork from Ice Ice Maybe. Ernest Miller's kicks look absolutely effortless. Wrath comes in and Miller takes a few strikes in the corner. He comes back with a standing sidekick. He tries a pump kick followed by another sidekick and Wrath decides that's enough and the cat takes a backbreaker. Wrath walks the middle rope and he misses an elbow drop. Cat tags in Glacier. Wrath pushes both guys into the corner, but then Chili Chode and Pussycat pull off tandem drop kicks. See, they're cheaters, they need a two on one advantage. Mortis was just walking along the apron saying hello to fans, and Glacier decided to punch him in the mouth, so Wrath gets revenge for his fallen compadre with a pump kick. Mortis then brings Glacier over to the fans to say hello, but his hand slips and Glacier gets whacked on the guardrail. That's unfortunate. Wrath pulls off a senton from the apron to the outside. He then finds a green steel chair and he wants Glacier to look at the pretty colours, but that clumsy Mortis slips again and the chair gets kicked into Glacier's skull. Silly Mortis. In all seriousness though, this looked good. Back in the ring, Mortis delivers some punishment in the corner, Glacier comes back with his erotic pole dancing kick, and Wrath surprises Glacier with a clothesline. We then see an awesome double team move from Wrath and Mortis, a sit down powerbomb and cutter combination, and the double team action continues when Wrath locks in a reverse Boston Crab and Mortis hits a middle rope leg drop. Mortis tags in, he misses a moonsault, the cat comes in to stop Wrath from hitting the death penalty and he gets a great pop after performing more impressive kicks. The four men fight in the ring while the referee keeps an eye on legal guys Glacier and Mortis. Glacier counters a suplex attempt with a DDT, but this gives Vandenberg a chance to put a chain around Mortis's foot. Vandenberg takes a cryonic kick, but this allows Mortis to kick Glacier in the chest and by god, Glacier does the job. Frosty Balls gets pinned for the first time in his WCW career, and Bash at the Beach has already gotten off to a great start. Truth be told, this wasn't on par with the other opening matches we've seen on WCW pay-per-views recently, but it was still pretty good. DDP's answering questions on the internet, some cheeky bastard wants to know who DDP's mystery partner is, and Dallas says it's his dad who's sitting with him right here, DDD, Diamond Dallas Dad. Very good. Paige isn't giving anything away, we'll have to wait until later on. Our next match is for the Cruiserweight title, Ultimo Dragon vs Chris Jericho, and it looks like the entrance pyro scared the shit out of Ultimo Dragon. Jericho starts off with a top wrist lock in the corner and he whips Dragon to the opposite turnbuckles. Jericho then experiences what it's like inside a dragon's asshole before getting kicked hard in the chest. Dragon performs his kick combo before hitting Chris across the back. He then applies a chin lock, a nerve pinch, and a head scissors submission. When the two get back to their feet, Chris hits his double power bomb. He follows this up with a running senton, and Chris then performs a suplex that makes Ultimo Dragon's face go like this. 
This has been pretty solid so far, but the crowd are chanting We Want Sting. A backbreaker submission from Chris Jericho doesn't lead to Dragon topping out. Chris goes for a side headlock from an Irish whip, but Dragon counters with a back suplex. There's a nice spot next to where Jericho hits Dragon with a quick moonsault, but Dragon's hard to beat tonight and he kicks out at 2. A double underhook powerbomb from Chris fails to end the match. The two then go to the top rope for what would have been a great dropkick spot, but. Shivani says Dragon jumped down on purpose, but what do you think? Chris hits a splash from the top rope to the outside. Dragon takes a scoop slam back inside the ropes, but he blocks Jericho's aerial attack. Dragon then tries to perform the Dragon Steiner twice, but Jericho counters both attempts. Chris then tries a splash to the outside. Dragon counters with a dropkick, and the two fight around the ring until Dragon's able to perform the Asai Moonsault. Back in the ropes, both guys try Mahistral cradles, but neither man scores the win. Another short fight on the outside sees Dragon hidden in Zaguri, but back inside the ropes, Jericho hits a lion salt across Dragon's back. Dragon again kicks out a two. Chris gets a little frustrated. He decides to try one more time, but Dragon hits a drop kick. Dragon then tries to put it away with a Dragon Sleeper, but Chris counters it. Dragon then tries to reverse another double underhook powerbomb, but Chris rolls through and Chris Jericho retains the Cruiserweight title. So far in our Reliving the War timeline, this has been Chris Jericho's best match. There was a great balance of high flying and hard hitting moves here, and this one felt more suited for the pay per view opening match. They got the crowd back as the match continued on too, so great work by both guys. Mean Gene Okerlund approaches Raven and Stevie Richards sitting in the audience, and Raven finally breaks his silence. He says, Trust and hate, and love and fate, and I don't understand. Social grace, the human race, confuse me. These words I speak bring forth a world of emotions of dreams lost, dreams found, and dreams I'll never see. So it is written, so it shall come to pass. Okie dokie. In regards to potentially being DDP's mystery partner, Raven says this is a question he gets asked time and time again since his childhood. Does Raven have any dreams to sell? Quote the Raven, nevermore. Mean Gene tells Raven to fuck off with all this Edgar Allan Poe bullshit. Stevie Richards then wants to have a word with, quote, Gene Gene Dancing Machine, but Raven puts an end to that with a good old fashioned backhander. Stevie mentions some sort of announcement tomorrow night on Monday Nitro. The Steiner brothers take on Masahiro Chono and the Great Muda next. Rick and Scott signed a contract to face Scott Hall and Kevin Nash for the WCW Tag Team Championships, but they didn't read the small print. To get to the Outsiders, Rick and Scott have to beat Chono and Muda. It starts off with Chono and Muda throwing Rick and Scott out of the ring, but the Steiners come back with some tandem aerial offense. Muda and Chono take a timeout on the outside, and the Great Muda shows off his sick face paint while some asshole fan with a Psycho Sid shirt on tells Chono to get in the ring or he'll get his ass kicked. I'm sure you will, big man. Scott hits Muda with a shoulder block, but Muda manages to kick Scott from the corner. A Muda chant breaks out as Scott gets choked at the ropes, and Muda follows this up with a jumping back kick. Scott replies with a big club to the back, followed by a double underhook powerbomb. Muda takes a press slam, and he decides to roll out of the ring to regroup. Rick then gets tagged in, and Muda gets out of the ring again when the dogface gremlin starts barking and running around the place. Masahiro Chono tags in and he immediately goes down with a shoulder block. He tries to fight fire with fire, but his shoulder block does no damage. So he rakes the eyes and we see the Yakuza kick. Rick's given time to recover and he goes for a test of strength. Chono ends up kicking Rick. Rick then performs a standing switch, but this leads to Steiner taking a back elbow. Chono hits a weak shoulder block next and Rick replies with his scoop power slam that looked more like a back body drop this time. We go back to Muda and Scotty Steiner, but this time Chono runs in to lend a hand. Muda performs the handspring back elbow, he follows this up with a bulldog. Chono comes back in to finish the job, but he ends up taking a top rope belly to belly suplex. Rick then comes in after a hot tag and the Steiner lines and suplexes are served on top. Muda takes a bulldog from the middle rope, Chono makes the save. But the punishment continues as Muda takes a belly to belly from Scott. Scott's top rope move then gets interrupted by Chono and Muda hits a Frankensteiner. We then see a dragon screw to Rick, but Muda gets too confident and his handspring back elbow gets countered with yet another suplex. 
All four men are in the ring and there's confusion over who the legal men are. Scott hits his own patented Frankensteiner but Chono pulls the referee away during the count. Mickey J argues with Chono and while this is going on, Rick and Scott pull off their doomsday DDT. The Steiners win the match and they win the right to face the outsiders for the tag team belts. Bash at the Beach is 3 for 3 so far, every match has been pretty fun to watch. Next we had a cruiserweight trios match, Hector Garza, Juventud Guerrera and Liz Mark Jr vs Viano 4, La Parca and Psychosis. Looks like La Parca is now officially being managed by Sonny Ono and it also looks like he dressed for the occasion. Things get off to a pretty rocky start for Sonny and La Parca though, Ono accidentally kicked La Parca and he had to pull out a wad of cash to remind La Parca why he shouldn't hurt him. La Parca then started pushing his own teammates around and this resulted in Juventud Guerrera nailing a backsplash on all three heels. And it wasn't this triple suicide dive that impressed me, it was Mark Curtis sitting in the corner and taking cover as the move happened. Psychosis performed a unique sunset flip from the top, there was a moonsault display by Hector Garza and Liz Mark Jr. It looked like bodies were just falling from the sky when the competitors began missing top rope moves. And then we get the usual dive over the top rope spot where everyone takes a turn but check out Juventud Guerrera sailing over the top rope. That's absolutely ridiculous. Eventually Viano 5 runs down and he replaces Viano 4 behind the referee's back. This wasn't enough to secure the heels of victory though, Viano 5 accidentally hits Psychosis and Hector Garza ends it with a springboard dropkick followed by a standing moonsault. The standing moonsault felt like a weak move to end it with after all the other crazy shit we just witnessed. Still good though, and hey, am I the only one who likes 1997 WCW pay per views? Because so far, I've had a great time watching all of them. Chris Benoit was supposed to go through some tests in order to get Kevin Sullivan back in the ring, but these tests ended up being matches with the faces of fear and nothing more really. One of those things that starts off as a good idea and nothing really comes of it. Benoit passed the test though and this is a career vs career match that, even back then, felt very predictable seeing as Sullivan was having less and less matches on a weekly basis. Jackie and Sullivan were seen having a disagreement this week on Nitro and during Sullivan's entrance, it's clear that their issues weren't resolved. The match starts off with Benoit and Sullivan beating the ever loving shit out of each other and Benoit ends up getting suplexed out of the ring. On the outside, Sullivan reorganizes the furniture a little and he lets Jackie whip Benoit into the guardrail. Chris tries to throw Jackie away but she comes back with a clothesline and Sullivan lands a right hand. Chris manages to get up and he throws Jackie on top of Sullivan. The fight rages on on the entranceway and Kevin ends up sacrificing Jackie to get an advantage. The two end up fighting at the entrance stage where the props become weapons. Benoit gets hit with the surfboards and it isn't too long before Jimmy Hart and Jackie get involved. Jimmy climbs up on the lifeguard's chair but Chris pushes him off as the whole set continues to get demolished. Jackie again gets involved and Sullivan gets the upper hand when the fight goes to the guardrail again. Kevin then plants Chris with a pile driver on the rampway and once he recovers he gets smacked across the face with a tray. We also see the devastating bunny hop. But Chris somehow absorbs all this punishment and he's in the driver's seat when the match gets back inside the ropes. Chris nails Sullivan with a hook clothesline but Kevin manages to throw Chris back out of the ring where Jimmy Hart lays in the kicks. He's no Ernest Miller is he? Sullivan then starts targeting the balls by crotching Chris on both the ring post and the guardrails right in front of Raven and Stevie Richards and Chris then gets floored with a clothesline. Back in the ring, Chris tries to give Kevin a taste of his own medicine but that doesn't work out too well. Chris lands a snap suplex next and Sullivan, uh, Sullivan sinks his teeth into Benoit's stomach. Benoit answers this by biting Kevin's ear. Benoit traps the arm and we see the crippler crossface. This stays locked in for quite some time but Sullivan doesn't give up nor does he pass out. He gets a foot on the ropes and Chris has to break the hold. Seconds later the crossface gets applied again. This time Sullivan grabs the bottom rope with his hand and you think Benoit's got it in the bag until a slugfest breaks out and Kevin starts fighting back. Chris gets hung up in the tree of woe, he takes three running knees and then Jackie jumps in the ring with a wooden chair. 
Sullivan wants Jackie to hand the chair over, he says, give it to me. So Jackie gives him it alright and the chair gets smashed over Sullivan's head. Chris then hits the diving headbutt and Chris wins the match. The in-ring career of Kevin Sullivan is over. Only it wasn't because he wrestled two months later for championship wrestling in Ohio, but his WCW in-ring career is indeed over. Except it wasn't because he wrestles again at Starcade 99. A good match here though, but not their best. I thought their match at Clash of the Champions in January was better. Jimmy Hart says Sullivan let the team down and Kevin pushes Jimmy. Jimmy says you'll be sorry as he leaves the ringside area. Looks like Kevin Sullivan gets a little teared up as he walks back up the rampway. Steve McMichael says that Jeff Jarrett should have never, quote, jumped in his chili as Steve and Deborah make their way down to the ring for the US title match. Mongo and Jarrett have had some, let's say, well documented issues over the past lot of months, while Jarrett was an active member of the Horsemen, but two weeks ago Ric Flair kicked them out of the group. So neither Jarrett nor Mongo have anything to lose by going full throttle tonight. Loads of fucking around at the beginning of this one with Mongo taking the US title and threatening to knock Jarrett out with it. Not sure what Mongo was trying to do here but I'm sure it sounded like a good idea at the time. And Jarrett ends up going to the outside twice. The first time was on his own accord when he took a 3 point stance tackle from Big Steve and the second time he got clotheslined over the top. The crowd chant Mongo on as he chokes Jeff with some cord and I absolutely love Mongo's apron elbow drop afterwards, fantastic big man. It was all going so well until that dirty fraud Jeff Jarrett starts ripping big Mongo off and he performs a few football tackles. Debra looks on with concern as Steve gets floored, Double J goes for the figure 4 so Debra gets on the apron and she passes the magical briefcase to Jarrett. Listen to Dusty Rhodes here after the briefcase shots. Oh, got him right in the elbow. Oh, right on top the noggin wagon. Double J wins. He retains the US title and it looks like he got himself a new manager too. Double J just completed some serious horseman business better than an actual horseman. And Mongo's left in the ring looking like a fucking fool. Old Debra, what a dirtbag. Hulk Hogan says it's nice to find another champion, another dirty dog like himself, someone who the Hulkster has something in common with, so that's a big fuck you to the whole NWO right there guys. Rodman says he and Hulk Hogan have arrived at Daytona Beach to tear the place apart, and Hulk continues on by saying Rodman spared the giant and Flexi Lexi on Nitro so they could get beat up tonight. Daytona can't handle Rod the Bod and neither can Team Giant Package. Hulk says the whole sports world is watching tonight. The two greatest athletes on earth have gotten together and everyone's paying attention. Hulk says Rodman's the greatest. Rodman says Hulk's the greatest. It's an absolute bro fest as the promo ends with Rodzilla and Hulkzilla saying when you're NWO, you're NWO for life. Rodman's a natural heel though and he gets it in terms of promos. Sure, what he says isn't what anyone would call great promo work, but he understands his part. The Diamond Dallas Page tag team match is up next. Raven and Kurt Hennig showed up two weeks ago on Nitro and everyone's guessing which one of these guys will team up with Page or it could be someone else altogether. Kurt Hennig walks out when DDP points at the entrance way so yeah, the former Mr. Perfect is the mystery man. The audience is indifferent to this too. Maybe Hennig shouldn't have shown up on Nitro and they could have had the big reveal tonight but anyway. DDP gets the advantage early on against Macho and Savage decides to fuck around on the outside for ages afterwards. A fan gives Elizabeth a bunch of flowers and she decides to throw them at DDP. Savage and Paige then spit on each other, lovely, and Scott Hall then decides to tag in. Hall wants Kurt Hennig so DDP tags out. There's a lot of history between these two but it looks like any friendship has been thrown out the window. Hall makes fun of Kurt's gut and he throws the toothpick in Kurt's face. Kurt spits his gum on Scott. There's a lot of fucking around in this one guys and the match is nearly at the halfway point. Kurt's forced to break a lockup in the corner and he smacks Hall across the face after the two shove each other. Kurt then punches Scott in the midsection and we see a knee lift and look at the state of this atomic drop spot. Fuck's sake lads. Kurt tags out and DDP goes to work on Hall. We see the diamond clash before Paige goes to work in the corner. 
Paul comes back with a good looking running clothesline to the opposite turnbuckles, and Scott tells DDP to suck it before tagging out. Macho hits a double axe handle from the top and then we get quick tags from the NWO, keeping DDP away from his corner in the process. Dallas takes a beating from both guys inside and outside the ring. He manages to pull off an atomic drop and this gives him a chance to tag out. We've got Savage and Hennig in the ring together for just a brief moment because our match has pretty much came to an end. There's a fuck up here, Kurt's supposed to go over the top rope accidentally because Dallas is holding the ropes down, but that doesn't happen. Kurt just hits the top rope really hard and Macho Man ends up kicking Kurt out of the ring. Hennig sticks to the script afterwards though and he whacks Paige on the back. Kurt leaves the ring and Dallas takes an outsider's edge and a diving elbow. The NWO win via pinfall as Kurt leaves the arena. This was easily the worst match of the night so far. I think WCW were banking on Hennig getting a better crowd reaction, making his heel actions at the end more impactful, but just like on Nitro this past Monday, nobody seemed to really care about Kurt Hennig and that's a shame. He definitely still had more to give. Thankfully his upcoming storyline serves him better, but it was definitely a forgettable debut for Kurt Hennig, in my opinion anyway. Roddy Piper and Ric Flair's troubles started at the Great American Bash when Flair chased six away during a tag team match and he didn't come back to help Piper. The hot rod was left all alone with the outsiders and of course he got beaten up pretty badly. Flair said he had the fight of his life backstage that night and he couldn't get back out to help Piper, and Piper forgave him. It didn't take long for Rick to show his true colours though and when Piper started a fight with Benoit and Mongo, Rick backed up his fellow horsemen. Rick would then make fun of Piper in the weeks leading up to Bash at the Beach with the help of mannequins dressed in kilts. And that's all we've really got here, this one doesn't go very far after this match. Roddy starts off aggressively and this makes the crowd pop. Rick takes his time on the outside to get his shit together but when he gets back inside the ropes, Piper completely lights him up. Roddy's so fired up he even ignores an eye poke and then we see the flare flop. The hot rod lands a few punches in the corner before we see the flare corner bump and it looks like Rick has no chance at all tonight. Roddy does sell the eye poke the second time around on the outside but that sell job lasts all of 3 seconds. Flair takes a back body drop before the match gets back inside the ring. Flair begs for mercy and Roddy drops to his knees to stick his fingers in Rick's eyes. Roddy then chokes Rick in the corner and when Mark Curtis tries to stop Piper, Flair takes advantage and he delivers a chop block. You know where this is going, Rick remains laser focused as he targets the leg and knee, throwing in a chop every now and then for good measure too. To his credit, Piper sells it well whereas just a few minutes ago he wasn't selling a thing, and he's good at vocalising his pain, he screams and shouts in agony as Flair continues to soften Roddy up. Finally, the figure 4 gets applied and Roddy's facial expressions range from great to comical. He manages to reverse the pressure and Flair makes it to the ropes. Piper then completely forgets to sell the damaged leg as he goes on offence but Flair puts an end to that with a low blow. Flair brings it to the corner for more strikes, but again Piper magically heals up and he hits Flair with a ton of rights and lefts. Piper then drops a knee that was a little low, but Dusty Rhodes says this was in the quote trespeasiest thing. <laughs> Flair counters a sleeper attempt with a jawbreaker but he can't put the match away, even when he uses the ropes for leverage during a pin attempt, Roddy still kicks out. Eventually Rick decides he's had enough and he pulls out those brass knucks that don't look like brass knucks but we'll call them brass knucks anyway, Bobby Heenan calls it a hand protector. Piper counters the punch and Rick ends up getting whacked with his own foreign, I mean international object. Big Mongo runs down and he distracts the referee while Chris Benoit goes for a diving headbutt. Piper moves and Flair takes the impact, but then Piper ends up taking Mongo's tombstone and that should be it all over. Flair covers Piper, Piper kicks out and the crowd absolutely loves it. Roddy ends up applying the sleeper one more time and Rick gets knocked out cold. He can't raise his hands for the third time so Mark Curtis pulls out the shooters. Roddy Piper defeats Ric Flair at Bash at the Beach. Like the previous match, I wasn't into this one too much even though the crowd in attendance loved it. It was better than the Hall and Savage tag team match though, that's for sure. But now we've got a main event that's got a big old question mark hanging over it. How good or how bad will Dennis Rodman be inside a WCW wrestling ring? 
Not a terrible lot of story going into this one. Back at Uncensored, Rodman was instrumental in the NWO beating Team WCW. In On Nitro, Dennis embarrassed Giant and Luger by nailing a few elbow drops and spraying NWO across their backs. Rodman stepping into the ring made the news though, the publicity alone is something that pleased Eric Bischoff a great deal, and as we learned from the Reggie White debacle, it didn't really matter to Bischoff how these celebrities or sportsmen performed in the ring, it was all about marketing and it was all about publicity. Luger and Hulk start the match off, the macho man is here and he watches from the outside, and Hulk tries to bring it down to the mat with a drop toe hold, I think. Luger gets right back up and he goes for wrist control, Hulk gets to the ropes and then he decides to throw his bandana in Luger's face, Hulk again retreats to the ropes afterwards. Hollywood poses at this Hulk Hogan wannabe but Luger then pushes Hulk to the corner and he does the crab pose. Hulk says Lex grabbed him by the hair and he even asks you guys at home to back him up, what do you think, did Lex grab Hogan's hair? Hollywood brings Lex down with a shoulder block, we see more posing, Rodman either likes what he sees or he's wondering what the fuck he just got himself into, Lex then hits a shoulder block and the posing gets real when Lex hits a 3 hit combo. Hulk knows he's got the biggest pythons in the business so it's time for a test of strength, Lex wants to go for it but Hogan lays in a boot and he calls Lex an idiot, Hulk then chokes Luger and Dennis likes what he sees. Hollywood then misses an elbow drop and he ends up taking a body slam, it's time to get out of there and tag in the real hot rod. And again Dennis knows what to do here, he plays up to it and he lets the crowd pop as he slowly gets in the ring. So here we go, how bad can this be? Rodman keeps backing away from Lex and he's building the anticipation well. I'd complain about this if it was anyone else but there really was intrigue here in regards to how Dennis would do in a wrestling match. The two finally lock up, the lock up doesn't look great, but… How about that? Andre! Wow! Andre Lex Luger! This well, well, well. The crowd reaction is great here, Lex sits in the corner stunned that he got caught out and Hogan celebrates Dennis's accomplishment. Luger and Rodman lock up again and this time Dennis takes two arm drags and his shocked look at the giant in between those arm drags was perfect. Hogan then tries to help but Lex also takes care of the Hulkster and the commentary team and the audience just lose their shit. You gotta give him credit, you'll hear a lot of people complain about the likes of Dennis Rodman showing up for a quick payday, and Hulk Hogan's WCW run is just too easy to rip apart, but they're getting the loudest reaction of the night here and that counts for something. Dennis gets back in the ring, he finds himself in a side headlock, he pushes Luger into the ropes, Dennis then performs a leapfrog and a shoulder block. This is good, but you know what's great? Randy Savage jumping on the apron only to point and laugh at Lex Luger. Luger's like, what the fuck's going on as the crowd continue to make noise? The two men get back to their feet, Rodman pulls off another two leapfrogs but this time he takes a clothesline from the total package. Rodman wisely tags out, Hulk says he's gonna break Lex Luger, but Luger decides to tag in the big man, a very fresh giant who hasn't seen any action yet. Rodman and Hogan discuss their battle plan and they tell Giant to wait until they're finished. Hogan goes on offense right away but he can't floor the Giant. Hulk decides to choke the Giant in the corner instead. Things get a bit scrappy when Giant no sells an eye poke. Hulk wasn't ready to go on defense just yet so he does it again and the Giant tries to chop Hollywood down. Giant then threatens Hulk with a choke slam and Hulk runs away in fear. He gets back in the ring after a group huddle with Rodman and Macho, he takes an atomic drop back inside the ropes and then Dennis Rodman gets tagged back in. Rodman vs the Giant. Dennis tries his leapfrog sequence again but he gets caught out and the Giant delivers a big atomic drop. The big man then slaps Dennis's ass for a bit, the crowd laughs, but Hulk Hogan runs in when the giant chokes Rodman and this kinda brings the crowd down, they want to see Rodman. The ref allows Hulk to remain the legal man without a tag but Hulk tags Rodman again and we see a double clothesline, Hogan stays in the ring afterwards. The heels start performing quick tags while Lex tries to help his partner but he's just making things more difficult for the big man. Hogan and Rodman pull off a double hip toss, Giant kicks out when both Rodman and Hogan cover him, and Lex gets the hot tag. Luger takes out everyone including the macho man, he signals for the bionic forearm, but Rodman manages to kick Lex on the apron and this puts the NWO back in the driver's seat. Hulk performs a back suplex on Luger, he then hits a body slam and we see the leg drop, 
Luger kicks out at two. Hulk lets Rodman finish the job and Luger takes three back elbows. He then chokes Lex with his boot. Hogan lends a hand from the apron and so the giant tags in. Rodman doesn't seem too worried, he thinks he has this, but the giant is all fired up. Giant cleans house and it looks like this one's all over, there's no stopping the giant tonight. But then, Sting shows up. And yeah, that's clearly not Sting. Sting steps over the top rope to get in the ring. He whacks the giant with his baseball bat and then he leaves again. Hogan ends up accidentally hitting Rodman while Dennis held Luger up. And that's the end of our match. Luger puts Hulk in the torture rack and Hulk Hogan gives up. Team Giant Package win the Bash at the Beach main event. Dennis Rodman takes a torture rack too, as does Randy Savage. And the Hills, the Hills celebrate at the entranceway, saying they're too sweet and Lex was apparently the illegal man. I mean, look at this picture, and look at this picture. Who looks like the winners here? This match isn't what you'd call a good in-ring work rate kind of bout, but you gotta give it to Dennis Rodman. He pulled it off and the crowd loved every minute of it. I know people don't like this, but I had a lot of fun watching this main event again. It'll never win any match of the year awards, but it was entertaining. I enjoyed Bash at the Beach 97 with the only real slip up being the Hall and Savage tag match. I didn't really get much out of the US title match either, nor the Flair vs Piper encounter, but I wouldn't say they were bad matches either, I just didn't enjoy them as much as others. Every other match on the card delivered. As for the main event, it won't be for everyone, and I understand too why some would dismiss it, but leave your star ratings and all that shit at the door and just have fun with it. That's what wrestling's supposed to be anyway. I recommend Bash at the Beach 97, but it wasn't as good as the WWF's Canadian Stampede. If you have to choose one, go with the latter, but don't sleep on WCW's July show either. That'll do it for this one then guys, thank you so so much for watching. I appreciate you guys sticking with this series and I'll be back again next week for another episode of Reliving the War. Take care.